Certainly do appreciate your presence today. Heavenly visitors, certainly appreciate you being with us. And invite you back anytime you have opportunity. At this time, we'll begin our worship with song as a brother comes and leads us. It won't be very long till the short life shall end. It won't be very long till Jesus shall descend. And then the day of Christ from beds of clay shall rise to meet the Lord. us with for this opportunity we have father to come to this place sing songs of praise to your name and study another portion of your will father we know that there's so much going on in the world and we pray for our country we pray for our leaders we pray father that things can be once again back to a somewhat normal time we pray that this virus can be gotten under control more especially, though, Father, we pray for our country that seems to be turning away from you so much. We pray that people will re-examine their lives and realize, Father, that they need you. We're grateful, Father, for this place that we have to come to these services. We're grateful for each and everything that you bless us with physically. More especially, Father, we're grateful for Jesus that loved us and died for us. We know, Father, that there's many of our number that are unable to be with us for health reasons and for recently having surgeries. And we pray for them that they can once again be back to their normal walks of life. We pray for all the ones, Father, that would like to be here but can't be. We pray that this summer, this spring, things can be restored somewhat back to normal. We pray, Father, that we'll always strive to serve you, and that if we will look to you every day, that that's all that's necessary. We're grateful, Father, for the love that you had for us. We pray, Father, that as we go through these services, that we'll each listen to Tom's lesson, and that we'll try to take something from it that'll help us to be stronger Christians in the future, and that we'll if we have any need to make anything right in our life, we'll do that before this day ends. We know, Father, we are simple and weak. 
Sometimes we do say and think things that are contrary to your will. We pray that you'll forgive us of these things as we turn from them. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Preparation for the Lord's Supper. several famous grave sites. We saw Lincoln's tomb in Springfield, Illinois. In Mount Vernon in Virginia, we saw the tomb where George Washington is buried. And in Arlington Cemetery, we saw the eternal flame where John Kennedy lays. And of course, Arlington Cemetery is filled with thousands of military people who, many of which lost their lives in war. And of course, then there's the tomb of the unknown soldier that is guarded 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Another unusual cemetery that we had went to some 30, 40 years ago now was in what was then East Berlin, communist uh, Germany. And uh, it, was a, it was a cemetery for Russian soldiers who were killed in World War II in the Battle of Britain. And uh, there were thousands killed on both sides on that final battle of war. And you, when you went in, there were five plots of land, one right after the other. And we were told that in each plot, there were a thousand Russian soldiers buried, standing up, facing Russia. 
it was it was an ominous sight to see. But all these cemeteries and tombs have one thing in common. The bodies that were put there are still there. But the tomb of Christ is empty. Just as Chris sang, up from the grave he arose. And his is different because he overcame death just as through his blood we can overcome an eternal death. Starting in Luke, the 24th chapter. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid, then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Let's offer thanks for the cup. Your heavenly fa- or for the bread, rather. Your heavenly Father, we're thankful for this bread, which to the Christian represents the body of Christ, and the sacrifice that he paid on the tree. Pray that as we take it, we'll do so in a way pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. give thanks for the cup in like manner dear Heavenly Father we're thankful for this cup which represents to the Christian the blood which Christ shed upon the cross I know that no greater love had anyone for us than you did in giving your son to die that shameful death upon the cross thankful for this cup bless it to our spiritual bodies in Christ's name amen That concludes the Lord's Supper, another part of our weekly services of giving. And uh, we, are, we have been so blessed. And we look in this past week, some people in Texas and different parts of the country, the, what they are going through with bad weather and no electricity, we are, we are certainly blessed. And there are plates as you leave that you can put your contribution in. Let's give thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to give back to you. We know, Father, that all that we have comes from you. We're thankful that we live in a land that we have the freedoms that we do and we have the opportunities to earn a living. Pray now as we give a portion of that back to you that it can be used to further your word. In Christ's name we pray. pray. Amen.
lesson this morning, number 755. If you will, please join me in standing. If you're willing to do that. <coughs> When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, the time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the sailors shall gather over on the other shore, and the rollers fall around the rock be there. When the rollers fall around the rock be there. shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use it will be measured back to you Jacob thank you very much for the Bible reading this morning and Chris great job in leading us in the songs good morning to everybody let's hold these up Luke chapter 6 great to see everybody today certainly is a blessing to uh, be here this morning. Uh, as I was sitting on the front, I noticed that uh, Charlie Ann was here because <laughs> I heard her. We're glad to have children always in our assemblies and uh, want them to learn and just grow up. Uh, learning the proper protocol in, in worship, so to speak. So it's always good to see them and to hear them. Let's bow together for our prayer. <clears throat> Father, it is with humility in our hearts that we're able to gather here once again. We've made it through another difficult week in so many ways. We continue to pray for those who are less fortunate than we are, and we know there are millions. And we're certainly thankful that we have heat this time of year, and we have water to drink and food to eat. Truly, we're blessed in our travels to have been provided safety throughout this week. We're certainly grateful to be here to start a new week. We're continuing to pray for those who are affected by the virus. We continue to offer up Tina's sister, Michelle, and our thoughts and prayers. Thankful, Father, for some degree of good news we had on her yesterday and pray for continued healing. We want to remember Tommy and Fred as they're coming out of some quarantine and just so many others, Father, who we, we miss and hopefully see them very, very soon. 
We're grateful to live in the United States. We know we face many difficulties and many challenges, but nonetheless, we know it is the greatest country in the world to live in. And we pray for our leaders on every level, that you would bless these men and women in their public service, and they'll recognize the need to do what's best as a whole and not as individuals. We thank you today for the blessings that are ours spiritually. We're grateful for the church. And we pray certainly during this difficult time of separation that soon we could be reunited and be together once again. Bless this message in the hearts and lives of all those who come. We're grateful for the interest that's shown here and we pray that the lesson will prove beneficial and helpful to those who look at it deeply and make application where necessary. Forgive us, help us, and use us is the prayer we offer in the name of Jesus who loved us and died for us. Amen. All right, as you know, we are in a sermon series on the life of Jesus. This really is, is what Jesus' life was like here in the book of Luke. We're taking this physician's account and what Luke does for us many times is he goes into greater depth and detail. He pays attention a lot of times to the details. And so that's why you see some of the specific things uh, that you see as you read and study the book of Luke. It's interesting to me as we come to Luke chapter uh, 6 that, that we have already seen uh, the first last part of Luke 5 and the first part of Luke 6, how Jesus was dealing with the pharisaical attitudes. And he continues to talk somewhat about that here in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 49. We'll be taking this in, in segments and in sections today to help us to understand it just a little bit better. But in my view, to really understand this Sermon on the Plain, you have to go back and look at the statement Jesus made in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. And he, Jesus was talking to his disciples here in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the tremendous challenge he put in front of them. I don't know if there's a more challenging scripture that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount than, than this. Because as we're going to see on a slide here in just a minute, the Pharisees were interested in the external. Jesus is telling his disciples, be interested in the internal. And so notice what he says in 520 of the book of Matthew. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness in the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, here, here are these people that, that talk about all of the external things that need to be done. Jesus says, I'm going to ramp it up a little bit, and I want you to be in a greater concern about the internal things that also produce the external. So your righteousness needs to exceed that righteous way of these scribes and these Pharisees. So Jesus is going to teach us today things that are internal which produce the external. All right? As you go back to Luke chapter 6 and you start at verse 17, it says that Jesus came to a level place. You know, it is my understanding, it is my uh, view that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is a totally different message than we find here in Luke chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 5, it says Jesus went onto a mountain. Here in Luke 6, 17, it says he came down to a level place. And incidentally, in this level place, and he gave a lot of repeated information, but the sermon is a little bit different, as we'll see. In this level place, there were some large crowds that began to follow Jesus because they'd already seen some of the miracles which he had done, and they were all always uh, eager to hear what he had to say. So notice 17, 18, and 19. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Even those who were tormented with unclean spirits and they were healed. Now I want you to watch verse 19. It's a particularly interesting verse. And the whole multitude sought to touch him. Why did they want to touch Jesus? For power went out from him and he healed them all. They knew and they had already understood that if they could just touch Jesus, that the power would come out of him. So this is a really 
interesting and fascinating verse. They were understanding and realized what Jesus could do for them. Now, when we get to chapter 6, verse 20 through verse 26, you're going to have what is referred to as some shocking discourses, some shocking teaching, similar to what you find in Matthew 5, 3 through 12 of what we refer to as the Beatitudes. These are just a little bit different. That's why I also believe this is a different sermon. Verse 20 says, He lifted up his eyes toward his disciples, and he said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast, you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to their prophets. You know, he talks about blessed, happy, fortunate, content. This is the way that you're going to find purpose for your lives. And again, a, a lot of similarity to Matthew 3, Matthew 5, 3 through 12, but, but also a little bit different. And, and here is what I believe the difference is. He, he gives blessings and woes, and, and what he says really is this. If you're persecuted now, you're going to have reward later. If someone says something against you now, just remember that later you're going to reap those rewards. So this to their ears would be shocking teaching. And then as we go to Luke chapter 6, 27 through 30, or 24 and following, and then 27 through 30, he's going he's to pronounce all of these woes. Like, woe to you who are rich. You're going you're to receive consolation. Woe to you who are now full or you have indulgence, for soon you're going to be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for soon you're going to mourn and weep. Woe, to, woe when men shall all speak evil of you or well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. So, so what, what Jesus does here is it's just a reversal. It's just taking what's said and it's just going totally in the other direction. So notice what he says in 6 verses 27 and following. I say to you, hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you do also to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Now, did you notice what he did? And did you see the list of things there? Number one, he says, I'm going to tell you something that you've not heard before. And this is going to be a shocking statement to you. I'm going to tell you to love your enemies. I'm going to tell you to do good to people who really don't want to do good to you. That would be a shocking discourse. I'm going to tell you to pray for people who despitefully use you and persecute you and would say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. I'm going to tell you to, to offer your, your, your cloak, your, your coat, the shirt off your back. I'm going to tell you to do good to somebody who doesn't expect that from you. I'm going to tell you to give, not because you want something in return, but to give because you believe good can be done as a result of it. And so all of those things that he gives there were just a reversal. And we see that really in, in the teaching that Jesus gives as he continues in 31 through 34. Notice what he says. Just as you want men to do to you, you do also to them likewise. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. So, so what you have here is a reversal in thought process. And it kind of reminds us of Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and what we refer to as the golden rule. What is the golden rule anyway? 
Well, we know what it is that we paraphrase, we treat other people the way we wish they would treat us. If you go out here in the world, and we see this all the time, if you go out here in the world and you slash somebody's tires, how would you like to go back to your vehicle and find your tires slashed? I said, well, I wouldn't like that a lot. <laughs> then don't do that to other people. And we could use this and do an entire sermon and go on and on and on and on and on about the golden rule, how we treat other people. And even there in Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus says, be complete, be mature, develop, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You need to be whole and complete just like that. So we have just a reversal and this is why it was so hard for them to comprehend this kind of information because they'd never heard anything like this before. And then we go to the challenging scripture, that, that segment there in Luke chapter 6 that just jumps off the page at us. Let's look at it in chapter 6, verses 37 through 42, and see if you don't see a lot of challenges here as we continue reading. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, this is what I had Jacob read a few minutes ago, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And then he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? And he calls them hypocrites. First, remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Is there anything any more challenging than Luke 6, 37 through 42? I'm going to put this word up here. It is reciprocal. It's the law of reciprocity. I mean, that's what it is. That's what he's talking about. In verse 37, he says, if you don't want to be judged, then don't judge others. If you don't want to be condemned, then don't condemn others. And it's just a reversal, a continuation of a reversal of mind thought. If you, if you want to be forgiven, you're going to have to forgive. If you understand the, the principle of, of giving, it is reciprocal. I can remember growing up hearing my blessed mother and father talk about their church contribution and their church offering. And I can remember my dad saying that when I, when I get when he got his paycheck, he said the first thing he did was write out his church check. First thing. He said, we live on what's left, but that's what we do first. And so that law of reciprocity has, has blessed our lives for generations in understanding that principle. And, and look at that principle in Luke 6, verse 38. You, you know what he's saying there? God has a bigger shovel. Have anybody used a shovel this week? God has a whole lot bigger shovel than we do. As we shovel in, God has this massive shovel and he shovels out. And that's the principle of Luke 6 and verse 38. And so what he does after verse 38 is he, he, he uses a little bit of a parable. And then there's that challenging teaching in 41 and 42 of how it's so simple sometimes to, to see fault in others without seeing fault in ourselves. And, and I don't know if you, you saw the, the movie or any of the clips about Jesus, some of the things that were uh, bannered about in, in some of the productions. There, there was one particular uh, movie that I watched about Jesus and his life, and it was on the life of Christ. And Jesus was with his disciples, just like we saw, say here. And, and he, he basically says to them in a paraphrase, he says, you see, the, you see the toothpick that I'm holding, this toothpick? And you see that tree, that huge tree over there? He said, you're telling me to remove this toothpick from my eye when you have a tree coming out of yours. 
And, and I never will forget that illustration in that, in that movie about Jesus. And again, look what he's talking about. That challenging scripture of, of what applies to me, I have to apply to me. And what applies to others, they have to apply to themselves in the area of, of being judgmental. And that's how challenging this scripture is. And then in the next segment, and we all know this is true. A tree is known by its fruit. A good tree does not bear bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. You see, what comes out of our mouth is what's in our heart. The things we say, how we come across how we talk to other people, how, it's, it's, it's right there. And, and so, you know, what I would suggest on this is maybe this point, that good actions come out of good hearts. Good actions come out of good hearts. We, we do good things because good things are in our heart. We do good works because good works are in our heart. We do good things because, first of all, those good things are in our heart. Jesus says a tree is known by its fruit. And then in this last segment, I think is maybe one that challenges us to take what we've learned and, and not just dismiss it so quickly, but to realize that there is something for us all. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show him whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house, and it could not shake it. Why? Jesus says it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. You know, what is... What is the message of Luke 6, 17 through 49? You know, you see all those little messages in there and all those little scriptures and all those little ideas and all that reciprocal language and all that reversal language. What, what really is the message in all that? You know what it is? Don't hear it and dismiss it. Don't hear it and say, boy, that, that sounds good. Don't hear it and say, boy, that's some good information. Don't hear it and just say, man, that, that, that's powerful stuff. Man, that'll really preach. Here's the message. Here's what he says. Hear it and then go do it. Amen? See, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. You, 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 you hear it, you gather it in, and you know it's true. And then Jesus says, I want you to go out there and practice this. I want you to practice this law of reciprocity. I want you to practice this reversal of mind thought. I want you to do it. It does absolutely no good whatsoever to, to get all of this information and just say, I'm going to sit on it. I'm not going to do anything with it. Early in my ministry, there was a man who asked me to come to his hospital room. And he asked me to read the Psalms to him. He found them comforting and encouraging and helpful. The most unusual thing about this entire story is this. The man never practiced what he heard. So how do you know that? Because he never did become a Christian. Because he never did follow Jesus. He just wanted to hear these words that would soothe him in his illness, in his disability, in his difficult situation, but he never put them into practice. I promise you. We can listen to sermon after sermon and class after class. We can read the Bible as the old evangelist Marshall Keeble used to say from kiver to kiver. You can read it from cover to cover, but unless we say I'm going to take this and use it in my world, then it's vain and useless. And so that's the message of Jesus. When you hear it, then practice it. Then do it. Maybe this morning there's somebody in the room who has heard it but they haven't practiced it. Maybe they haven't been buried into the water grave of baptism. Maybe they haven't taken the messages out here in modern day life and says, I'm going to apply that uh, to my life today. 
and, and when I go to the workplace, I'm going to apply it. Should I live tomorrow? And I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. The invitation is an opportunity to make a public proclamation of what you're going to do in front of God and even others. And that opportunity is available right now, Chris, while we stand and sing our song. Sinner Jesus will receive salvation. Tom mentioned Tina's sister Michelle is still in intensive care and on a ventilator. But yesterday afternoon, she did show signs of improvement. So I want to remember that family. If you didn't hear, Tina said they're going to try to take her off the ventilator today. Hopefully, that's a that's a su success. Also, many of us know uh, Linville Pruitt, his Bobby's brother, and related to some of us. He is in intensive care also and not doing well. Uh, not doing well at all, so we want to remember that family. Also, uh, Thelma and Shorty's son, Fred, will have knee surgery Thursday. Is that right? Thursday. Tuesday, I'm sorry. I heard the T. <laughs> and two, they have a neighbor, Benny Wells, that uh, is in the hospital. And I think he has COVID, doesn't he? Yeah. He's not doing good either. He's on a vent, so I want to remember them. I have a card that was passed along to me this morning I'd like to read. It said, we appreciate all the thoughts and prayers that were offered on our behalf while we were shut in with COVID. 
quarantined. We also appreciate the food left for us and, and offered and the offer of it. The kindness and thoughtlessness of our Mount Pleasant family is truly appreciated. This is from Greg and Lenore. Also, I was sitting in the chair yesterday morning, right after breakfast, and I told Judy, I said, I've got to get up there and see, check on the parking lot. I said, I forgot all about it. So, drove up here, and I'm talking about the church parking lot. I drove up here, and Willard was out there on his bobcat cleaning the parking lot, and I almost was done. So, I forgot all about it. You see Willard? Slap him on the back. He did a great job. Also, uh, Richard came by, and uh, and now we come on up here, uh, parking lot. Willard graded it, but he couldn't. It was an inch of ice under the snow. We couldn't do anything with, so we left it. Come back yesterday afternoon about three o'clock, and it was gone. The ice had melted, just like it is right now. Uh, put down a little salt. But thank Willard when you see him. He didn't forget I did. <laughs>